agenda item three, approval of the agenda. Do we have any changes? None from staff. Council? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Agenda item four, proclamations and presentations. Tiberius Chamber of Commerce update by Executive Director Jay Scott Perry. Good afternoon. Um, you should have my report to the council in your packets. Uh, a couple of things I would like to thank Mayor Fister, Mr. Jury, Mr. Tweedy, and those who attended our annual uh, Business of the Year Gala on October 6th. It was a fun night, uh, very good. Mr. Jury's presentation was just perfect, um, and it was great to have everybody there that night. A uh, couple of things tomorrow night is the gator crawl. Uh, we are changing this gator crawl bike night a little bit. Um, uh, it's evolving and tomorrow night should be a really exciting one because it's happening right after the 5k kicks off. So it's all, there's going to be a lot of activity going on downtown tomorrow night. Be a fun night. The tent will be at O'Keefe's. Uh, we won't have the gator crawl bike night in November because that's the same night as our Taste of Tavares and tickets are on sale now. Um, we have them at the Chamber office, we have them online. This year we can purchase Taste of Tavares tickets online. Uh, that was something that was asked for last year and we, with our new system, have that available. The Taste of Tavares is November 16th. We still have a lot of vendors signing up, but so far, and we've just really started to push the last two weeks, we have 10 restaurants, we have 11 businesses, and there's another 10 plus restaurants who have the application, just haven't gotten it back to me. So I think it's going to be our biggest, best night at the Pavilion on the Lake, uh, November 16th. Um, and I encourage all of you to come to that. Uh, it'll be a fun, fun night. The other thing at the bottom of my report that I asked you to put on your save the date is our Chamber Holiday Business After Hours Party. Um, and the date is there, but that actually may change. We, will, we have a board meeting in the morning and we're going to be discussing changing that date. So don't put that on your calendars just yet. I will be sending you all the council and email as soon as that date is uh, firmed up. And you see there the rest of all of our activities going on this month. Any questions you have for me, uh, let me know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barry. All right, tab two, proclamation, the Atlantic Coast Young Marines Red Ribbon. Whereas communities across America have been plagued by numerous problems associated with illicit drug use and those that traffic them. And whereas there is hope in winning the war on drugs and that hope lies in education and drug demand reduction, coupled with hard work and determination of organizations such as the Young Marines of the Marine Corps League to foster a healthy, drug-free lifestyle, and whereas governments and community leaders know that citizen support is one of the most effective tools in the effort to reduce the use of illicit drugs in our communities, and whereas the red ribbon has been chosen as a symbol commemorating the work of Enrique Kiki Camarena, a Drug Enforcement Administration agent who was murdered in the line of duty, and represents the belief that one person can make a difference, and whereas the Red Ribbon Campaign was established by Congress in 1988 to encourage a drug-free lifestyle and involvement in drug prevention and reduction efforts, and whereas October 23rd through 31st has been designated National Red Ribbon Week, which encourages Americans to wear a red ribbon to show their support for a drug-free environment. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Tiberias proclaims October the 23rd through 31st, 2017 as Red Ribbon Week in Tiberias and urge all citizens to join in this special observance. All right, moving on. Swearing in by City Attorney and disclosure of ex parte contacts. Mayor, there are no quasi-judicial matters on the agenda tonight. Of course, you may recall that we had scheduled a, a big rezoning matter. Uh, and just for the sake of the audience that may not know, that the, the developer asked for a continuance of that. And, and uh, there were some procedural issues that we thought should go back to the and go back through the process and we'd start the application. So that will still be coming to you, but it's not here tonight. And so that's not going to be heard tonight. And we don't have any other quasi-judicial matters that are here that are going to have here. 
This could be held at the Civic Center. We will get the word out via social media. Mike can do it from the churches. We will hold our such events every four months. That such events will be held in the evening so citizens who have to work can attend. That's from Chief, Chief Steve uh, Stoney Lubins. Subsequent to that, Councilmember Bobby Bernier met with Pastor Mike, and together they set up a community meeting and set a date for October 24th at 7 p.m. at the church conference room located at Friendship CME Church, which is at 29608 Camp Road, to discuss race relations. Both Councilmember Bobby Bernier and Pastor Mike Watkins are here today to invite the City Council to attend this community meeting. As the pastor has put it, the purpose of this meeting is to show unity on race relations by listening to each other on any perceived issues that may exist between the people of this community. Great quote from Pastor Mike Watkins. And like I say, um, myself, the pastor, and three other pastors actually got together not too long ago to start setting this up. Pastor Mike, why not um, talk to the council and, and uh, citizens a little bit more about this, please? Good afternoon. Uh, here's, here's what I feel that we live in a beautiful city with great people. And somehow it seems to me that there seems to be a big emphasis on the differences we have instead of the things we have in common. So it's my desire that we work toward having something like a unity day where all the citizens of the barracks can come together at Moon Park or wherever and just have a great time together, laughing, eating, and having fun. But along with that, I think that there needs to be, or we would like to have some meetings where we can discuss uh, differences or issues that are, we see in our society. We can listen to one another. Because I think a lot of times, people are saying a lot of things, but people are not listening. So I'd like for us to meet and listen to each other. And of course, it'll be the first meeting of maybe many meetings. I know talking with the chief, uh, he's willing to uh, have a meeting where the police department will answer questions about stuff with the police department and their procedures and everything. But uh, hearing what people have, I think I listed here, uh, every pastor in the Tavares area, area was given a letter or email, but also uh, the city administ administrators, city council, <coughs> school officials, some, some pastors, uh, business leaders and youth uh, leaders will be involved. We're probably going to be about 40 people that I, I expect to be to the meeting. It may only be 15. Uh, I, I really don't know, but everybody's been invited in the sense of uh, people who work with a lot of different people, and especially with the young people. And so I'm looking for a good turnout and for us to talk and hear suggestions of things that we feel. See, Tavares needs to be the city that shows the world that we are in unity that we have more things in common than what we have different. And I think this is a great city that can show that throughout days like Unity Day and other things that we can do to bring our community together. I'm a preacher of the gospel. That's the good news. We hear enough bad news. We need to focus on the good things. And that's what I want to be a part of. There's some tough issues I believe we got to talk about, but if we listen to each other and respect each other, I believe we can start making progress one of my members said it like this, between burying our head in the sand and making every issue a racial issue or a problem, somewhere in the middle of that, I think we can find some common ground and help show others what this city is about. I love raising my family here in Tavares. I love it. I love the people. But there's issues in our country. There is. There's issues in our country. So we, we have to, you know, start talking about those things and talk about solutions bringing people together. That's my whole purpose. No political agenda or anything like that. Just simply want to bring people together. And I know we can do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the pastor is right when he says that Tavares could step up to bat here and be, and we talked about this at that last meeting that we had, that we can uh, be a spotlight, be a city that uh, steps ahead, steps forward in these type of discussions which you aren't hearing coming out of any other City right now, and I think this was great, and, and I applaud you, Pastor Mike, for, for wanting to come out and do this. Um, you've been a friend for so long. Now, um, this October 24th meeting, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Williams and Mr. Jury, what uh, we're going to look for. Is this is the, is the council able to go, or should I just represent and make reports? How should this work? Because uh, I know this is something that is going to be just wonderful for our city 
and, uh, and, and our relations with the, not only the black heritage, but we have a growing Hispanic population um, coming here, an influx of young people, young families coming here as well, that we really want to be able to be able to communicate, to continue to build to various, long after many of us are, are gone and on the way to keep this going and make it even stronger than it's ever been before. So on this October 24th meeting, um, I think I think the council has two options. One option is that uh, the police chief and I, and I think you, are planning to attend, uh, uh, which is uh, the, you know some of the leadership in uh, the city, and join our friends from the school board and uh, the others that you invited, the teachers and uh, what you've reached out uh, with, uh, and that. Um, you know, would be just placed on our calendars, and we will be there at seven o'clock to, to to have the discussion and, and get going. Another option is, you know, if the full council wants to go, the issue with the full council going, which you can do, is of course we uh, under the under the Florida law, uh, we would have to publicize it, advertise it. Um, we'd have to take minutes. We'd have to have a clerk there. Uh, I could. We'd have to go in that. So we have had. Uh, board members represent various issues. There's a lot of issues in the community. Uh, I know Mr. Singer is uh, a board member that represents us on the chamber uh, and all the chamber issues. And so he goes uh, by himself to those meetings and then gives updates from time to time on that. If you want to follow that, I think uh, Mr. Grenier and I and the chief can attend and then we can bring back uh, how the meeting went uh, and share that with you. So. Those are the two options, and uh, it's really a board decision. So, council, how do y'all feel about making this just like we have a chamber and we have different things, and let's choose Councilmember Grenier as to be our representative, then he that way we're not violating any sunshine laws at all. He can bring things back to us, and if there's something that needs to be agendized, that way whoever's interested can come down once it's agendized, and then we can have a full discussion legally at that time. What do y'all think about that? The only question I have is this for the past year. I mean, if what we're saying here is if all of us attend the meeting, it's a violation of the Sunshine Law. So now we have to make it a public meeting. If we're making a public meeting, then there's no telling. You may have 150 people there, which would be great, right? No, because um, our bill can't hold. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I would really, I would really like to be, uh, I would really like to be involved with this, but, mm -hmm. but because of the issues of it having to be a public meeting, I am, I am certainly okay with Bobby uh, doing it. Uh, I think this is great. I think it's a great idea. Um, it's just a, it's, you know, our laws are our laws. So, can I uh, say this? Can I say uh, this is just the first of hopefully a lifetime of meetings in the sense of maybe every quarter come together and talk about. It things, you know, uh, plan events that we can do as a city, you know, and also deal with issues that we feel that we need to address in our city and listen to one another. So it won't be the only meeting. Next time maybe it'll be at the uh, Civic Center. I just opened up my church in the sense of uh, for this particular and, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, uh, the pastor and our group, and we put the pastor uh, uh, in charge of getting a hold of most of the community leaders. So we thought we'd start that way. And the community leaders can then just bring back to their various churches, organizations, what have you. And we can build on that eventually, uh, pack in the Civic Center and other places. And again, where it leads to is probably events, uh, unity events here in Tiberias and beyond that. And also to continue discussion um, with all the different um, groups, organizations, races, religions in here in the state of, in the city of Tiberias. So if you are all uh, like, uh, yeah, I think uh, I'd like to have a motion. Uh, a motion. I'd like to have a motion to the effect of. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, have Bobby Bernier represent the city council at these uh, community meetings. I second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Bobby, do you want to? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'd like to time. suggest uh, that Councilmember Smith could be the alternate. We always have an alternate, and he was interested that way. I would be, uh, would be happy to be the alternate. So, okay. So any more discussion? Right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 5 to 0. There we go, Pastor Mike. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
knows where the church is at. All right. We're going to move on now to tab 11, the session on zoning requirements for medical marijuana dispensaries for Senate Bill 8A, Mike Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mayor. On August 20th, 2014, the City of Tavares passed Ordinance 2014-12, which added to the City Regulations a definition of medical marijuana dispensary and amended Chapter 8, Table 8 to permitted and special uses, allowing medical marijuana dispensaries in a C2 highway commercial district. Uh, on June 23rd, 2017, the Florida Legislature passed Senate Bill 8A, uh, amending Florida Statute 381-986, requiring that local government agencies either ban medical marijuana dispensaries within their boundaries or allow dispensaries to operate within the same zoning districts that would allow pharmacies. City zoning regulations would permit pharmacies in commercial downtown, commercial C1, and highway commercial C2 zoning districts. Therefore, current city regulations are inconsistent with state law as they pertain to permitted locations of medical marijuana dispensaries. At this time, city staff is seeking council's direction in drafting an ordinance to comply with state law. Thank you, Mike. Yes, sir. The, um, this has been an evolving thing. If y'all could watch this, the original ordinance that we adopted was before the first referendum on medical marijuana that you may recall failed. And so the, the cities all put, most cities put some restrictions or some locational criteria in place to be ready in the event that that first one failed and it didn't pass. Then they came back, altered the ordinance or the uh, uh, amendment a little bit, and that one passed. In reaction to that passage, some cities began to uh, re strictly regulate locations of medical marijuana dispensaries within their cities. They put them in industrial, or they had setback requirements or locational requirements. And the legislature preempted that by passing the, the statute that Mike just read to you. It's exactly what it says. You get two choices. Choice A is you can either ban them completely, and a number of your, some of your local cities have done that or are at least looking at that, and I think maybe Lake County is. Or you can allow them, you're required to allow them in any district where you allow, allow traditional pharmacies. So those are your two choices. It's a sort of an erosion of our home rule powers that us municipal people don't like much, but that's what happened. So those are your two choices, and right now what we've got isn't consistent with either one of those two choices, so Mike's bringing it to your attention appropriately so we can fix it. All right, thank you, Bob. Um, I have one person that wants to speak on this, but I've been asked many times by people in the audience, they don't like to come up and speak first. They'd rather hear a little discussion up here first, and I have no problem doing that. So if y'all would like to discuss this for a few moments or ask, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, any questions or uh, our city attorney before I let someone from the audience come up? So why don't we just start with why don't we just start with you, Mr. Grenier, Councilmember Grenier? Why don't you give us some of your thoughts? Or well, I already know where I'm going as far as you know option two here, but I do want to ask the, Mr. Williams a question. Are they? What I'm reading here, are these medical marijuana outlets, stores, um, they're calling pharmacies? Well, I mean, that's not sure the power, power, I'm not sure they call it a pharmacy, but the statute says that the dispensaries, places to sell medical, places to sell medical marijuana are required uh, to be, if the city allows them at all, you have to allow them every place you allow pharmacies. Amanda, I guess my question is, do we have restrictions on pharmacies in the city of Tavares? No. And where would be the areas that the dispensary could even be available to open if we allowed it? The, the restriction on pharmacy would be to um, commercial downtown, which would be right, right in downtown, C1, which is the lighter commercial, which would be maybe up on uh, old, old 441 Alpha Street, and then C2 Highway Commercial, which would be on New 441. So it would be allowed in any one of our commercial <coughs> districts. Whereas now we, we are restricting 
marijuana dispensaries only to C2, which would be on US 441. The state is telling us that we're inconsistent with them, that we have to allow them wherever we would allow a pharmacy. If, a, if someone wanted to open a pharmacy in downtown Tavares, I would certainly approve a, an occupational license or a business tax receipt for that business in downtown. And, Mr. Williams, how difficult would it be if we were to ban it if in the future we decided to change your mind if we were able to be more restrictive to remove that ban? I mean, it's just what the council will do if the council can undo it. So, yeah. I mean, you can always, you can, if you restrict it, you can always change it back. If you, if you allow it, you can always remove it, but you can't remove piece of people that come here and, and open stores. Those, those would be pre existing. <coughs> council member Smith. Yes, well, I think you just answered my. My first question is, if we approve it, can we uh, reset? And I believe the answer was yes, but we can't kick out anybody that's already there. Yeah, that's just basic zoning law. When you, if you do it, and it's legal when you do it, and then the government changes the rules, you can't. Right. You can't extinguish uses that were legal when they started. That's a grandfather rule. Or that's exactly the same grandfather. I, I, uh, I, I'm on a different mindset. The city, or the, the voters of Florida voted for this thing. Um, I'm sure it's going to be, uh, the legislature have made it where it's only medical marijuana and it's non-smoke, I believe. So it's going to be prescribed by a doctor. Now, there's a lot of people out there that, that could use the help of this medicinal item. So I, I'm, I'm okay with, with the uh, zoning. Uh, yeah, you know, like Mr. Williams said, you know, it's the classic case of, you know, erosion of our own rule where you know, the city should be able to make, you know, our own laws that don't go against the state laws. Uh, you know, back in 2014, we said, you know, these dispensaries were allowed on 441, which, you know, would be great if the state would allow us to make those decisions right here where it affects the citizens the most. You know, right now it's being taken out of our hands. So, you know, we've got a choice where we need to say yes, and it can be everywhere, or we say no, and it can be nowhere. Um, you know, the way it reads right now, and like Mr. Williams also said, you know, if we don't approve the zoning right now, we can always approve it at a later date, but we don't know exactly how these dispensaries are going to work right now. You know, they're still, um, you know, kind of in their infancy. So I would kind of like to take the idea of, you know, let's look and see how this goes throughout the rest of the state. You know, at a, at a later date, if something that we think you know is beneficial, then yeah, we could go ahead and allow them. But right now, I just you know I don't see us being able to allow them and not work out, and then that dispensary, you know, wherever it might be, on 441 downtown, you know, it's there for ever. So I would kind of like to just take the let's wait and see look for right now. Okay, and I think I'm like Councilmember Smith. Um, the voters approved this. The voters spoke. It was approved. Um, I think there's strong regulations. Um, I also, I just think it was the, the voters' will. So I think we have really no choice but to follow through with that. So with that, I'm going to call up uh, Denise Arada from the audience who said she'd like to speak on this item. Denise Larada, Royal Harbor. Um, I am in favor of having this medical marijuana dispensary from town. The voters have asked for it, and right now the only difference I see in what you approved before of allowing them on one commercial area is it would be allowed in three commercial areas. But I have some personal interest in this also. I lost both my brother and my sister to illnesses that if this had been available would have alleviated a lot of their suffering and would have made their transition out of this world a lot easier. And I would hate to see any other person that might benefit from this not have the availability of a medical dispensary close by with so many cities and counties banning it, it's, it's going to become more and more difficult for people who actually can benefit from this, that have a prescription for it, 
to be able to get it in an easy way. And I think that we should do everything that we can to be able to alleviate suffering for people when it's legal, and this is legal and it's very regulated. So I see no problem with having it in the city. Thank you, Ms. Barada. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. State your name and your address for the clerk. Your record. My name is Rick Gonzalez. I live at 34841 Estes Road. I uh, don't live in the city limits, but I work in the city limits, and I have three properties, four properties in the city limits. I also have the pleasure of sitting on the Clay County Planning and Zoning Board, where this issue came up uh, this month, or this past month meeting. It was on the consent agenda, but it was pulled off of the consent agenda because the board wanted to discuss it because we thought it was a very important item. And it ended up being a four to one vote with one abstention to deny the ordinance because we, generally speaking, it was, well, from my point of view, I happen to have several nurseries for sale and I've had more activity in the last year. Uh, significant business opportunities coming to this county and in fact there's one nursery growing right now and the message that a ban sends to the general public and especially business people is that you don't want our business so we're going to go to the next county over. Um, if you look at Sumter County they passed an ordinance open open the door for business. I think um, two things I agree with kind of, Council Member Smith and Baron Fister, that the general public voted for this. You should give them what they asked for. I think that there's a mindset that you're worried, if you're against it, it's probably because you're worried people are going to be sitting around stoning on the streets. That is not the case. This is medical marijuana. You don't get stoned from it. It is something that is very beneficial to the people that need it. And like, I just want to repeat myself that Banning it really sends a bad signal to the business community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Vance, state, state your name and your address for the clerk. For the Vance Yoakum, 12619 Milwaukee, Tavares. Uh, I'm on the opposite pole. I've traveled all over the world. I've been around people that uh, have gotten on pot. And I look at this as once you let an organization open up an, an outlet, there's going to be heavily pressure to expand it to recreational marijuana. It's happening in California, where I moved from. It's happening in Colorado. And I think that Mr. Uh, Singer uh, is probably correct, is that you don't know how this is going to work out. The county um, board, just to clarify what uh, the previous speaker said uh, the county board is probably going to move to ban it in the county and uh, the planning and zoning committee that he's on is the one that uh, decided to go against that because they have to discuss it because of the planning and zoning issue. Um, the, I just, I cannot tell you how worried I would be if I was living in a city that has opened up outlets that then there's going to be tremendous legal pressure to expand their markets. They already now have got a law that apparently has been submitted to start uh, being able to market uh, marijuana, medical marijuana candy or cookies or something like that, you know, brownies, I can remember those from many years ago. And I just I think that you shouldn't be the guinea pig. You ought to let other places be the guinea pig. They can all get it by mail. That's been stated at several meetings that I've been at, that they can get it by mail. So they've got that. You've got at least three cities that have already proved it. Mount Dora, Astatula's ban is going to expire. I was at the meeting where they voted to do that. And then you've got the mascot. So I would think that you ought to be very cautious about this because if you want to attract tourists uh, and you want to have the, the, the ambiance that uh, you have voted, to, you can go to Mount Dora and let them go there. But I personally think that it's really the wrong move. All right, thank, thank you, Vance. Okay, Council, um, do we have any more questions? Okay, we have a motion to approve the 
Um, and also the chief is available if anybody has any questions for him, if you want to know anything about the legalities or anything. Mr. Williams? Um, my understanding is that the nurseries have gotten some licenses to grow. Um, has anybody tried to pull a permit to become a dispensary in Tavares? A dispensary or a... No, I don't think we have had an application yet, have we, Mike? We haven't had any... Uh, applications for business tax receipt for dispensaries. And it, it's my understanding, and, and uh, Attorney Williams can correct me, that the dispensaries are going to be controlled by people who have been given a license by the state to cultivate. That the only people that can open a dispensary are those who, who have complete vertical integration in the entire process, cultivation, distribution, and sales. Do we have any nurseries? <laughs> Running into various computers, they are cultivating. Not, not to my knowledge. And I think. Um, <laughs> and I think my understanding is any physician who wants to prescribe has to go through an accreditation and licensing process. And I think the only one locally is Dr. Dillard. I don't so, know. Um, I mean, I know they have to go through licensing. I don't know that. I don't know which ones have done that. But not one inquiry about a nursery or anything. I have not received any at this time. But I will agree with, with what Rick said anecdotally. There are, I mean, uh, nurseries are, are hot commodities right now um, in the real estate market um, because people are looking to try to be able to get into that industry. And also, I want everyone to consider that we do have a hospital. We do have a hospital in our city, um, Florida Hospital Waterman. So I think that should make us a little more accommodating to people. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm kind of like Denise. I've uh, I've watched too many people suffer. I've uh, and I've watched what it can do. And and Vance, I understand what you're saying, kind of. But, but we're not we're not comparing apples to apples. You're talking about pot, and we're talking about medical marijuana. It's two totally different. It will animals. expand it. I can tell. Um, you. It's, it's not that way. And if you, I did some research, and if you check in Colorado, you know they did have medical marijuana before they had recreational marijuana, and they had zero problems, zero, other than, you know, it, it does generate <coughs> a lot of money in their community. But there's really been no problems to speak of, and it is regulated, and what these people have to do and jump through these hoops. I don't think they're going to jeopardize that to go off and just start, you know, to me what's worse here in our town is uh, the, these guys who, you know, the pill mills where they just write these prescriptions for the opioids and stuff that people are getting addicted to. I mean, this is something that's not addicting. It's medical marijuana. It's not pot. I think that we would be doing our citizens an injustice if we don't pass this. The voters voted on it. They voted on it in the state of Florida. This is what we wanted. Mayor, if you don't mind, I, I just want to, um, I guess, talk to the council a little bit. 2000, I guess, 2014, the council passed placements of where to put medical marijuana dispensaries, and it was in the C2, right? That's correct. Okay, so I don't know where the reservation really is about going into uh, C1 or downtown. Uh, we got a tattoo shop downtown to Bears. Everybody says, oh, a tattoo shop, right? Well, it's one of the nicest tattoo shops you've ever seen. They got nice people there. They do a great job. Uh, we've got an entertainment district. Oh, remember that one? Oh, man, an entertainment district. It's going to be all, everybody's going to be everywhere. That entertainment district has transformed the city of Tiberias. Uh, I don't see where the reservation is for the, for this, and frankly, um, it's not hot. Um, the ACG is taken out. It's been refined. Um, the voters voted on it, and there are people suffering. And you know, if you don't if you don't quite understand, look into it a little bit. But I, I think we should move forward. And then with that, I'm going to make a motion that we approve. Uh, let's see what is it. Your ex staff to uh, amend regulations to allow medical marijuana and commercials only districts. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. More discussion. One comment. 
of course, this doesn't change anything today. We'll bring the ordinance back to you, and there'll be two readings and notice and everything. Okay, that changed a little bit for me here. I'm going to see an ordinance come. I'm not voting on. You're voting on what, what to direct us to do. We have we have to fix the ordinance we've got one way or the other, and I'm going to, we're going to bring it back. I'll be all direct us to, and then and that has to go through the whole process. Okay. Okay. All right. Changes little things for me okay. too. Well, yeah, that would give you time to do research. Okay. If it changes to. everything. Thank you. Just so I mean, the ordinance, it's not really going to change. It's still going to be, it's allowed or it's not allowed. Is that correct? That's right. Right okay. now, we have to get rid of the ordinance that we currently have. We need to fix the ordinance we currently have. It's not enforceable. So I mean, the other option is to just get rid of this ordinance and vote no at this time. That's correct. On okay. But depending on which way we go, the way I was thinking now, I can actually do more discussion and make that decision once I see what this ordinance looks like. Like all ordinances we've done before. Right. You're, okay. not, you're not amending the law today. You are giving direction to me and the staff to prepare ordinance. You'll amend the law in the future two readings from now. Any more discussion? All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes four to one. Okay, we're going to move on to tab 12, request to waive special event fee, YMCA Turkey Trot 5K, Mike Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mayor. Staff has received a special event application from the Golden Triangle YMCA for its annual 5K run to be held on November 23rd, 2017. No city services, staff, or equipment is being requested. The application has been processed and staff is prepared to issue the permit for this event. The permit fee for special events outside the downtown entertainment district is $250. Ms. Christy Kay, the Wellness Director of the YMCA, has requested that this fee be waived. A uh, copy of the request was put into uh, the Council packet. Uh, City Council has waived the fee for this event in preceding years, and staff is recommending that City Council moves to approve uh, the requested fee waiver. Right. Council, any questions for Mike, or how would you like to move? Move to approve. Second. Motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. All right, moving on to tab 13, approval solid, solid waste contract. Chris Thompson. Afternoon, Mayor and Council. At the June 21st City Council meeting, staff was directed to, be, to begin negotiations with the commercial solid waste collection and residential single screen recycling contract with the top ranked firm of Waste Management Incorporated. Staff met with Waste Management Negotiating Team on a number of occasions, resulting in a contract proposal for Council's consideration. I've highlighted some key, some key points to the new contract that we feel are improvements to the present contract. They're listed on the summary. Uh, the final draft has been submitted to the City Attorney and is presently being reviewed. Uh, staff offers two options for the for council's consideration. Option one is authorize the city administrator to enter into a five-year contract with waste management for the commercial solid waste collection and residential single stream recycling. And option two is to not authorize the city administrator to enter into the contract. Staff recommends option one, authorize the city administrator to enter into a five-year contract with Waste Management Incorporated for commercial solid waste collection and residential single stream recycling. Fiscal impact will be determined based on how much garbage is hauled. And legal sufficiency is right now at Bob Williams' office. Uh, we have to do a couple little minor tweaks to make it legal, uh, but that's where it's at. The, he's got the final draft. Thank you, Chris. Council, do you have any questions for Chris? No, uh, Ms. Williams, but what Chris is saying is a couple of minor tweaks there. I mean, is it, they're so minor that it won't even be. Yeah, we have an existing contract. Yeah. It's going to be, this is going to be very similar to what we have. So nothing that's going to be substantive. 
No dollar. I'm sorry, I have a question. Why is the physical impact to be determined if you've already got the contract and you know what the prices are at the time? I don't understand that. Well, what I'm saying is as, as the, uh, the commercial businesses change, our collection uh, yardage changes, that's going to change the numbers. Okay, you're doing it because of the, because of the commercial uh, changes into the contract. That's correct. The overall okay. year. That makes sense to me. Okay, thanks. Mr. Thompson, so we had uh, a firm go out and solicit companies to come in and bring us uh, their best um, bids, right? They, they didn't solicit them. What they did is they rated the ones. We, we did the soliciting. They came here and gave us a request for proposal. We had an independent firm rate them to uh, recommend us what would be the best firm to negotiate with. So those were the three firms that were, um, that we Yes, sir. Waste management. Okay. Okay. Um, way up, and way so up. all three firms had an equal shot at you know, keeping this contract if they, depending on which one was the best, of course, and that's the one that you have this um, potential contract to go with. That's correct. We feel it's a good contract. Yeah, I mean, I looked at it, it looks like a good contract, and I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we uh, direct the uh, city administrator into a five-year contract with waste management on this contract. Second. Right, we have a motion to second all those in favor. Uh -huh. Motion passes 5 to 0. Thank you, Council. Moving on to Task 14, approval for utility Sorry. technicians to install a force main on Lake Eustis Brad Hayes. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> the objective is to consider approving a contract with utility technicians to install a, three, a new 3-inch sewer force main to potentially connect 17 to 25 existing homes to our sewer system on Lake Eustis, Lake Eustis Drive in the amount of $98,415. In 2016, we entered into an ISBA with the county. Lake Eustis Drive area happens to be an enclave um, in the city. Uh, these are all the homes that are over on the Lake Eustis Drive and they have septic systems. They are starting to fail. Um, we've been asked to consider installing the lines and help the residents. We have completed a hydraulic evaluation of these 17 homes on the west side of Lake Eustis Drive <coughs> um, and propose to uh, connect them to uh, Force Main Route and tie, the, tie them in and tie them into lift station number 27 which is right there on Lake Houston's Drive near the uh, condominiums. Um, so the options are to move to approve the uh, contract in the amount of $98,415, and the funds come from impact fee reserves. Do not approve the contract. Um, staff's recommendation is to uh, move to approve the contract in the amount of $98,415, and the impact fee uh, uh, on appropriate balance is uh, $3.9 million. Any questions for Mr. Hayes? Of course. <laughs> so how can we not run water too? There's uh, an existing water line there already. So we already have an existing water line going down there, and now we're just adding sewer to it. Correct. The next question is, I guess it would be for Bob or for for John, if any of these houses hook up to the city, would they now then have to be, are they in the county or they in the city now? They're in, they're in the county and they would have to, they would have to annex in. That's so, correct. And if you want to hook up to our store, you got to annex in. Okay, so then that leads to the next question. Um, would that create a hopscotch of enclaves that we couldn't handle or no? Not really. Currently we have an enclave out there. So we own the property on one side, or we, property on one side is in the city, and there's property out by the hospital, and um, Etowah is in the city. So we have a county enclave, and I think once the sewer line fills in the gap, over time, as their septic systems fail, um, they will tie in to the sewer line, and they would annex into the city. And remember, Kirby, under the ISBAs, um, creating gap, creating gaps are 
or hot scotches is not a problem as long as we provide sewer. So the whole idea of the IBA, ISBA is to create infill um, or to allow infill <coughs> to fill in and to eliminate some of those enclaves as long as we provide utilities. Which means individually people can't annex in. They'd have to, it'd have to be a certain amount of... No, individuals can annex can in. Can annex in. Okay. their property. Yeah, yeah. Anybody that wants to that's within our ISB area can annex in if we provide them utilities. So, all, for instance, all those people at Lake Junietta, they've been getting <coughs> utilities for 35 years. If they want to annex in, they can annex in. But we don't hook new people up unless they agree to annex in at the time we give them we hook them up. We didn't have that rule in place when we did Lake Junior. If we did, then we'd have them in. <laughs> Are they interested in Lake Junior or no. they interested? Because that's just that one little section on the east side now. Well, I, they are diehards. <laughs> so these residents, they have the option of tying in. Yeah, we do not do forced annexation. You have to want to come into the city. We we never force anybody. If you want to come into our city, we will welcome you. Um, as long as you have water to it. But it's an interesting point you raised, Troy, because the health department, you know, to the extent they need a septic tank or they have a septic tank that fails, the health department has regulations that would allow them to not permit a new septic tank and require them to hook into us. But the city of Paris does not. We don't have that ability to go out to the county and force people to hook that. That was one question. Thank you. How would you like to move? contract. Uh, for Mr. Drew, go ahead and uh, get the contract. I'll second. Motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 5 to 0. Moving on to tab 15, approval for purchase of two portable emergency generators by base. <clears throat> the objective here is to uh, approve the purchase of two portable emergency generators from Genset Services in the amount, total amount of $141,335. City of Tiberias was recently hit by Hurricane Irma. During a storm, the city lost power from our two <clears throat> power utility companies. In order to provide water and wastewater services to our customers, the city utility departments depend on emergency generators to operate the sewer pump stations. These generators were running constantly for days at a time. We have seven generators that need servicing, and three of these generators quit running after a few days. Some of our generators were purchased in the late 1980 and early 1990s. The city has continued to grow to the number of lift stations increase. So staff recently sat down with our rate consultant to go over the budget to secure assurances that we were okay to purchase these two generators and create a plan to purchase uh, one generator after this for the next five years. Just a point of interest is that we have close to 90 lift stations in the city and uh, we've got to run around with what few portable generators we have, trying to keep it flowing. Not to get through. And uh, so I'm asking that we uh, move to approve the contract in the amount of $141,335,000. I had a senior moment and I put down $98,000 by mistake. Any questions? You answered the only question I have. All right. And we've got someone from the audience who would like to speak on this issue. So, Denise Lerada, come on up. Denise Lerada, Royal Harbor. Um, I recall, John, when you talked about what the city did after the um, hurricane, about the fact that we loaned, actually loaned generators out to, uh, I believe it was the county, to help with traffic lights, while Brad's team was running around with the few generators that were left moving things through the city quite well. And this morning in the paper, there was quite an interesting article about the lack of generators throughout the entire nor uh, northern part of the uh, state here and how difficult it was to keep traffic signals going and the problems they had with this. So I would be definitely in support. Actually, I would be in support of you buying all of them right now so that Tabari's is, has what, it's, what is needed, but certainly at least the two. Thank you, Ms. Ravonna. Council, how would you like to move? Make a motion to approve the um, purchase of 
two generators for $141,335. A second. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you all. Yep. Moving on to tab 16, award bid for public safety complex, Chief Keith. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. For the record, Richard Keith, the Fire Chief. Uh, agenda item uh, 16 is um, the objective is to consider approval of proposed bid recommendation and funding strategy for the public safety facility project. So I brought with me a, a visual aid, uh, two rolls of uh, plans right there. That is our bid package for the public safety uh, facility. Um, our goal now, and hopefully tonight's agenda item will take us a step closer to achieving that goal, is to make those two roles into a building. So um, we're close. We went, um, our Horizon project team, of course, has been working on this for years. We've been talking about it for 10 years. Uh, we've been working in earnest for at least seven years. We've had, um, as part of our Horizon project team, Council Member Bob Grenier. So, Mr. Grenier, thank you so much for all your work doing this with us. Welcome back from Chi Town. We're glad you're back safe and sound. Um, we uh, we did advertise for bids. Uh, Mr. Finance uh, Manager, uh, Person Manager John Rumble has walked us through that process. We received six bid packages back. We opened um, we opened those on September the 28th, and on October the 4th we met. Uh, in this room, and we um, we went through and compared and evaluated those bids, and I have those numbers on your agenda packet. I apologize to the uh, to the audience for not being able to see those numbers. They are on the agenda packet online. Uh, you'll see that the lowest bid came in at thirteen million four hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars. So um, the uh, if you could go to the next page under funding strategy, you'll see there uh, kind of a, a high level um, glance of, of where we are. So we had previously earmarked, uh, Lori Hoekner, our finance director, uh, had previously earmarked $11,570,000 for the project. Uh, so then when you take that bid of $13,477,000 plus $950,000 for FF&E, furnishings, fixture, and equipment, left with a balance of 14427000 which that's a shortfall of $2,856,468. The um, finance director, Lori Houghton, the, the, the Horizon Project team, we went to work again, and um, Ms. Houghton thinks that uh, she has a proposal to present to you, and that's really what we're doing tonight as part of this presentation is a, a way to bridge that shortfall. And I, I think what she has devised here, and I'm going to let her elaborate on that, uh, or answer any questions you have about that, is a bridge loan to get us through. So on the next page, you'll see the options. Option one, the city council may move to award the construction bid in the amount of $13,477,000 to Warden Smith. Now, Warden Smith is a general contractor that gave us the lowest bid. They also were apparently highly, um, highly, what's the right word? Qualified. qualified, thank you. Apparently highly qualified and the lowest bid. So that was why the, the uh, bid review group chose them. And going on, so award that construction bid to Warden Smith and authorize staff to secure a loan for the additional funding for the project. Now option two, the City Council may move to reject the bids and direct staff to pursue a different course of action as identified by Council. Now, in our process with the agenda packets, we have to have these ready for Susie and, and City Clerk the week before. So we went to press with this last Thursday was the deadline. Since then, we have developed uh, an option three. And I think uh, Mr. Drury is going to be able to, to speak to option three which I think we like even better. It kind of cleared things up. It'll make sense to you. We just apologize if you don't have this in writing. We I think, the I think you know, option, uh, it's really probably not a third option. It's really uh, option one. It was that move forward. The only thing is, instead of uh, awarding it in the fixed amount of 13477 and authorizing staff to secure the loan, it would be in an amount not to exceed 13477. Uh, we think there's an opportunity to 
work with the low bidder and maybe find some cost savings and get it down a little bit. Um, uh, so we would prefer that you uh, awarded it in an amount not to exceed. And as long as we don't exceed it, then we move forward, we'll get the loan, we'll bring the loan back to you and the interest rate and all that. Uh, and we'll move forward with the project. If, uh, well, that would be about it. We just can't go over that number. We have to be at or below that number. Uh, if you move forward with option one, I would just ask you to say not to exceed. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Drury. So, um, we have with us here tonight in the audience our architect, Mr. Michael Latham, from Gator Sketch Corporation. And of course, we have Finance Director Ori Houghton, City Administrator John Drew. You have me, he has a police chief. So, uh, as you go into discussion on this, if you have any questions, if we can shed any light, we would be glad to do that. So, Mayor, thank you very much. We'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, Council, do you have any questions for any of the above? Uh, yes, no, we're talking not to exceed. Now, if we're able to get some off, does that then take some off of the loan that we're going to need to balance off this off just to make it public? Yes. Okay, very good. So, uh, that, was, that was one of my questions. Is it going to be like a guaranteed maximum price contract? Did the bidder, did the bidder agree to a guaranteed maximum price contract? That is the price that they bid the project on. Right. And then there is an allowance for, I think it's the glazing on the windows, which we would sit down with them and see if we can bring that part down some. I just want to make sure that the contractor understands that this price here is, although it's his bid price, um, that, that if, if it goes into it, there's no change orders that would make it go over. So, you know, a lot of contractors yeah. bid low and hope for change orders. Yeah, the only change orders that would be permitted are unforeseen. So, if you go out to the site, the engineer has done core samplings of the materials that are in the site and has estimated the amount of fill that needs to be removed or added. If the contractor goes into the site and tears it all up and finds an unforeseen item like a sinkhole or uh, clay that wasn't you know, anticipated or debris from the previous owner of the school board, uh, and that quantity is different than the engineer's estimate we look at the amount that the engineer put in the bid specs. We look at the actual quantity that was uh, in the field. And if those two are different, then there's a change order for this unforeseen change. Um, so change orders will be very uh, specific to unforeseen things that were not in the bid spec. But that means that this could exceed that number. Yes, it, it, I mean, it, uh, if you're out in the field and you run into some issue, you could exceed that number. Right. And that is a change order process that we go through with all of our contracts. And normally, we would have about $100,000 or so in what we call reserve for contingency. And that reserve for contingency would uh, address any change order that was unforeseen. In this particular case, um, there is practically zero dollars for contingency, which means that if there is a change order and there is no dollars in there, I'll be coming back to the council and saying we ran into a unforeseen condition and we need some additional dollars. We had great engineers on this. I don't think there's going to be any unforeseen conditions on this one. Now, the next question is from Ms. Houghton. Um, the extra $2 million, $3 million, $3 million. Uh, it's all going to be uh, continued on with any sales tax, right? That's what we're estimating and assuming. We will work with the financial advisor. We will um, to secure our loan with the two banks that we um, stated in the agenda summary. This way we can fast track this because we do have timing constraints on the bid. And then we will bring this back to council so you will have your vote on the loan. We do have a the bid is only good for 120 days, so we get to pull this loan together, get it all approved by our financial advisor, backed up by the penny sales tax. 
back to you, interest rate negotiated for approval before the current bid expires. We think we can do that. And, and, and another response to your question, Billy, is we will work with the financial advisor to make sure our estimate of what we're going to use to support the loan is correct, or if there is any, um, anything that we need to inform your council, we'll come back to you with us. Thank you. I only have a question. Once we get started, how long for construction? Ten months to eleven months. Good question. Yes. Ten to eleven months to build the building. My council, how'd you like to move? I just have a quick thing I like to say. I mean, I know that this has come before us a couple other times. I know this has been going on long before I got on here. I mean, we just need to move forward this project. This is something that's. You know, very important. You know, we've got other projects that we want to get started on. You know, people keep asking about when we're going to get, you know, parking down in the Wooten Park area. Well, we can't move forward on stuff like that until we do this. But, you know, I just, I just want this to go ahead. And, you know, let's move forward. Um, I know that the shortfall is two million eight hundred and fifty-six thousand. That we're talking about. Um, you know, doing the um, bid at you know thirteen four seventy-seven. I mean, is it possible we could just Put a little contingency in there and just do a flat three million loan. Is that an option as well? Uh, we can, and there, the actual loan probably will be a little bit higher than this, up to, up to sixty thousand if you consider cost of issuance, the legal fees on our end, as well as their their side of the financial review um, and all the, the documents that we have to uh, prepare. Um, yeah, I mean, if we went ahead with that. And there's a contingency, you know, it can be paid out of that, but if there's no contingency issues, then you know, we can just use that money to pay back on the loan, right? We can. I mean, right now, if we do it for the exact 2.856, there's a possibility to come back. We'd have to go through that. We'd slow the project down even more. And, Troy, we always, when we negotiate, one of the biggest things we do negotiate is no penalties for any prepayment. I mean, I'm just going to, I would be willing to do, you know, another loan for the pre late flat. Well, I'll move to approve and get this started. Not to exceed $13,477,000. And the loan amount, $3 million flat? $3 million flat. Okay. Second. We have a motion to second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mayor. All right, moving on to tab 17, performing art center request for proposals. Phase one, John Drury. This is a request to authorize staff to move forward with phase one of the uh, performing arts center. Uh, and library. Previously, the council budgeted $60,000, which represented 50% of the cost to complete phase one of the Performing Arts Center and the library. Uh, and that would then include uh, site selection. That would include program and uses, construction budget, annual operating budget, all the funding sources and grants, and renderings. Um, I have included a scope of work uh, in your these things, uh, which lays out uh, everything that's going to get done. Um, it was hoped that the 50% cost, um, remaining cost, would be uh, come from the college. You know, it was, uh, uh, so we looked at colleges. Uh, we looked at uh, two colleges, and uh, none of those colleges were in a position to partner with the city at this time to do phase one. Um, so at this time, the Horizon team got together, and we're recommending that the city go it alone, uh, pay the full $120,000, and move forward with phase one of the um, Performing Arts Center. Uh, the finance department uh, has identified an additional $60,000 from uh, savings in the health care program, uh, and combined with what's currently budgeted, that would cover the estimated cost to do phase one. So at this time, uh, we're looking forward uh, to your approval to move forward with phase
phase one of the Performing Arts Center. Thank you, Mr. Jury. Council, do you have any questions for Mr. Jury? I have a question. On that proposal, so the proposal, it would be 120,000 total to have this, all this stuff done. Right? That is correct. And what would be the time frame to get that all completed? One year. Is there any way that you could like split that? It's been 60, 60 that we have budgeted right now to get some of this work done in the next budget process to another 60,000. Well, I think I think the problem with that is um, even yes, you could split you could split it up into two fiscal years and turn this scoping into a two-year process. I think the only issue is you know your surroundings change, your community changes. Um, the Performing Arts Center is a uh, minimum of a four to five-year process. So the first is site selection, programming, the construction budget, the funding sources, the annual operating budget, making presentations to the council. After you're done with all of that, if you have found and lined up the funding through all the grants that they're going to talk about, then you go through another process called the design criteria package. That's where you do the design criteria. That's almost a year, maybe less. And after you're done with that, you go ahead and solicit or design build companies. Um, and it's probably a two-year project. So you're just pushing it out further. Uh, that would be the only really, uh, I guess, downside of it, is pushing it out. And if your landscape, your landscape, you know, the landscape of your community starts to change. I just hate the fact that we couldn't find a you know, partner to help us out with this. Cause... Yeah, I mean, I think the partners are going to show up. I, I really believe that if you move forward with this, and then next year <coughs> it looks like the funding can be achieved through all the various grants, tourist development taxes, and all available, um, you're going to see partners starting to kind of join you. And that's what the sol solicitation of proposals is, to get out there and if we can get that partner to yep. get on there, absolutely. Because I think you're right. I think the reputation of Tiberius and where, what we've done so far and where we're going and the ideas, there's going to be somebody out there who's going to want to get on the bandwagon. And it's sort of like the seaplane base in Marina. We went forward, we built it, and then we got a partner. Jones Brothers, they came on board, and they moved forward. The, the pavilion, we went forward and built it, and then we had four caterers and Lots of people get married there, and then the train. the train. We ended up with the chamber, and uh, well, now Polar Express. Uh, so I, I will not be surprised that as you, if you move forward with this, uh, the partners are going to be knocking on your door, wanting to participate, both financially and uh, you know, things they want to do. Any more questions? Uh, uh, yes, I'm going to come. Of course. Sorry, Mayor. Um, how much do you anticipate phase two costing? Well, as for the consultant, because there's got to be a consultant on everything. Right. So, if you look at Design criteria package. Right. And if you look at number six, final report. Okay. And look at B. Okay. They are supposed to provide us the estimated cost to develop the design criteria package. Right. So we don't know what the design criteria package is for two reasons. One is we don't know where the site's going to be. We don't know how big it's going to be. We don't know what you're going to put in it. And we also don't know how far along the design criteria you're going to go. When you do design criteria for design build projects, you can go from 30% to 60%. That's a, that's a council decision. So when you're done with phase one, they're going to give you a range of price based on how, based on 
what you all, what the community, because there's a lot of public meetings and workshops with the cyber and cyber, based on the sign, and then are you doing a 30% design criteria or a 60%? And that changes the price. So I can't give you that cost at this time. That is actually one of the things they're supposed to come up with. And there's going to be a, um, a cost for the design and build consultant services. No, that design build is just that. It's you design it, you build it. Okay. One number. All right. Well, the, the, the only problem I have with, with this is um, we've tried to solicit two partners, and both partners um, decided that wasn't a good opportunity at this time. Now, I have a hard time approving $120,000 when we've made promises to, to fix West Main Street. West Main Street is going to be one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars, and that took a big chunk of, of what we're doing out. I said, "Well, we'll go out and try to get grants for this consultant work, as we did for our public safety complex, uh, to see if we can get a grant to help us with this thing, and then see if the partners come and use the money here, the one hundred twenty thousand, for some of the things that we've already said we'd do next year, i.e., West Main Street." I think. When people see commitment to something first, it's usually going to sway them to join on to a bandwagon first. I really do. I think uh, as people laughed at us about America City, Clean City, didn't think it worked, and I heard this from everywhere, and to varies. Uh, I just think that when you really set your mind to something or commit to something, somebody sees that, I really believe they get on the bandwagon. I just don't see it being very difficult to get a partner or partners in this performing arts. We're going to get West Main Street going, I know. We've already talked about it. We're going to get it moving. We've got plans in place for that. Um, I think we just, uh, need to uh, show the commitment towards this performing arts, and, uh, and we'll, we'll get those people. I know we will. Super confident, because everything else has worked for us, that we will get these partners. Okay, I'm going to um, move to approve option one to authorize uh, solicitor proposals to complete the past scope of work of phase one performing arts and library facility to authorize the recommended budget amendment. The staff recommendation. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, any more discussion? I think I have a, uh, one question. Uh, John, did I hear you right? You said that you found, we found money, savings from insurance or something to take care of this extra 60. It's not like we're going into reserves or anything for it. That's correct. So, so found money is good. Let's use it next year on some physical projects that are ready to roll. Well, I guess I'm going to have to speak up now. Um, Y'all know I've been working on this for a long, long, long time. And I've done so much research. I just, I don't even know if, how much more research is out there that I can even look at. But everything that I've seen tells me that this is what is missing. This is the piece of the puzzle that's missing from our city. I feel like this is so important. We have all the attributes that make us a small town destination except for arts. We have no cultural arts. We have no performing arts. We just, I think this is the answer. We have everything else in place for it. And y'all know how long I've, I've worked on this, ever since I've been on this council, which is a lot of years. So, I would like y'all to at least consider this, that we move forward. This is the closest that we've come to going anywhere. And I'm like, John, I really feel like the reasons why we don't have partners right now, uh, you know, were very good reasons. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Lake Sumter didn't have the vision at this time that we have. So uh, I just think there's opportunities out there. I just think we need to move ahead. So I'm not against the idea of, of, of the Performing Arts Center. I'm against the idea of spending $120,000 to 
have some consultant do phase one, why can't we do what we did with the public safety and try to get a grant for that? Have we even reached out to try to get a grant for this consulting thing? I, I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, the performing arts grants are a little tough right now. That's been the problem. I'm not saying they won't open up here in the near future as we move forward with this. We just have a good opportunity right now to move forward. We have a lot of things in place. We have a lot of different areas that this could work at. We, we just need some guidance, some professional guidance for people who do this for a living. I, I think it's important to our community. I, I think it's important to our community that this is the type of growth that, that we're wanting. I, I feel like it's very important. Well, the growth is there, but I agree this is something we have a public works building now, right, Chris? We need real bad. Are a couple of things that I would love to see um, ratified and on its way to um, fruition in the time that Lori and I are here uh, working on things like this for a long time. Um, I agree with the mayor totally, and I still think that once we show the commitment and start moving forward and it gets out there, um, we're going to get the partners and we're going to be in fine shape. I think we're going to be just fine, and I think we need to get that public. That uh, public safety built, I think we're at the Performing Arts Center, and this will be that destination that we already are, but enhanced even more. Come on, for moving forward. I guess my position is I want to see if this idea has legs. Um, until we get something started, we won't know if this project is going to sink or swim and whether we should invest more money in it. So instead of delaying this and talking about it forever, I'd like to just pull the trigger and find out whether it's going to sink or swim. And let me just say, I mean, I'm all for the performing arts. Um, you know, I too want to see this thing. I don't want to see it drag on like we've seen with the public safety complex. You know, I'm all for this. But, you know, one thing I do agree with uh, Councilmember Smith, I'm just, I, I'm having, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that we just finished the budget process. And, you know, at that time we had a lot of things that we had to cut. And now we've, you know, found the $60,000. That's just, you know, what I'm having a hard time with. Um, I, I wish this would have come up two months ago before we finished the budget process. And we could have, you know, said, okay, well, we didn't find any partners that want to go in with us on this. So we need to uh, budget under twenty thousand dollars. So I mean, I'm kind of torn. Um, you know, right now I want this project to go forward. I don't want to delay it another year like we've done in the past. So you know, that's where I'm at right now. I just, um, you know, I knew that we had the sixty thousand dollars budgeted, and now we need another sixty thousand dollars. So right now I'm just, um, you know, I'm torn with that aspect right now. I think uh, that's a good, very good point. That's a very good point. But I think when we were doing the budget process, the performing art was always on our mind during this whole thing. It was one of the things that was listed at we I know, I was, speaking for myself, was trying to make room to make sure this thing continue forward um, as well. Great point. But I know we've discussed this and, and sure, to make room to know that some of the things that were cut were cut. That's why I purposely went through the cut list at one council meeting. I mean, we went through the item that day. Um, to make sure there were things. And there were a couple of things we did bring back. Always known things like the public safety, the performing arts, are something that we need to get going this year. As, as well as we talked about West Main Street as well, making sure we get money set aside for, for doing something with West Main Street, which is, you know, will always be on my mind as well. Great point, though. You're right. Any more discussion? <coughs> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Um, Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes three to two. Okay. All right, now we're going to move on to tab 18, authorization to develop RFP for design build services, uh, seaplane based marina docks and refueling system, Bob Tweedy. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, as you're aware, the city of Tavares has operated a seaplane based marina here in the, at the Wood Park waterfront since 2010. Uh, thanks to Irma, we, uh, we had some exterior redecorating uh, out there, unfortunately, uh, suffering devastating damage to our uh, marina and seaplane-based docking systems and on-water fueling systems, uh, which require a rebuild. And uh, in order for us to maintain our status as uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, capital waterfront city of Lake County and our brand as America's Seaplane City, we certainly need to rebuild those facilities. 
Uh, we have met with our insurance carriers and, uh, and, and been given their assurances that they will be providing their timely and full financial support for our recovery efforts uh, and, and complete in, 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 in that effort. Um, they have also advised us to go ahead and move forward with uh, procuring uh, construction and design services through our own procurement uh, uh, methodology. And, and so therefore staff believes that the, the way to move forward with this in, in the most timely and efficient manner is to develop an RFP to, to go out for uh, proposals for design-build services to reconstruct the marina. So that's what we're asking for at this time is your approval to do so. Um, and uh, with that, I will uh, take it back over to you, Mayor, and, and answer any questions you all may have. And I just want to add that um, we have public risk management as our insurance carrier. Uh, and uh, they brought their team here right after the hurricane. Um, public risk manager spreads its risk. So Lloyds of London, AIG, um, takes 30% here, 20% there. Uh, they flew in from England, from London, to join the team. Uh, and we met uh, with public risk management, their team, Lloyds of London, who just uh, come over from Europe to, to see everything. And I can tell you, I really felt a high level of confidence with our insurance carrier. It really made it clear to us that um, we purchased insurance in the event that something like this would happen. And they are going to stand by our side throughout this process, and they are going to support us throughout this process. So I'm looking forward uh, to uh, rebuilding uh, the core of America's seaplane city, our seaplane base and marina, um, better than it was before. Uh, and um, the insurance carrier is going to stand by our side to pay for it. I think the um, the ratio is 98% Correct. Uh, will be covered by our insurance carrier, uh, and our portion will be 2%. So with that, we're hopeful that you uh, allow us to move forward with design, build, and redoing our seaplane base marina and fueling facilities. Any questions, y'all, for uh, Mr. Trudy or Mr. Jury? Oh, well, just to clarify, um, request to develop a request for proposal. Explain, develop a request. We have, to, we have to put something together to send out, right? So, yes, it's a two-step process. Uh, we have to um, get on board uh, a uh, person that does the uh, preliminary design uh, criteria. do that, that's at 30 to 60 percent that I talked about earlier for the other project. And then when that's completed, we go out for design build. They bid on the project. Um, both those contracts will come back to the council. So we will solicit a request for proposals. We will solicit bids to rebuild <coughs> the seaplane base and marina. Those bids will come in. We'll share them with the council. We'll be I think we'll, we'll be developing a we'll be uh, doing a request for proposals for a firm to do the design criteria and then when that's done we'll go out for another request for proposals to do design built. Okay, um, the this council will all be in place for the next term. Um, we really want another thing we really want to get going. Um, an estimate of an estimate of how long something like this takes to put together to bring to us. Okay, to bring back the proposals to you, we're probably talking the first one probably in 60 days, and then the actual design build proposal. Hundred and, so hundred and, uh, another 60 days, so that's 120 days to have a bid in place to go forward with the project.
Council, how would you like to move? Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. Moving on to uh, to agenda item ten. Old business. Any old business? Mayor, if I could, I would just like to uh, thank this council for allowing me the opportunity to go to the American Blue. It was a wonderful, wonderful showing. I was happy to be there to help support. Great team that we had up there. Uh, Chris Thompson, Tracy Anderson, and Wendell was up there. And to Barry's, we did outstanding. We, uh, for our first year, we ended up with four out of five balloons. We were the top three in environmentally friendly landscaping. And we won the number one coolest spot for kids. I thought that was pretty exciting. Because of that, we have, because of the Splash Park, Wooten Park, Aesop, Discovery Gardens, and the Polar Express, we were named number one coolest place for kids. I thought that was pretty neat because a lot of times when people look at Central Florida, they think about retirement communities. Well, they saw the, the things that really made the city of Tavares something special was, you know, families. And they described us as, in three words, I mean, pride, passion, and vision. And out of the uh, uh, joining American Bloom, I think most of our council received the 42 page um, booklet that American Bloom sent to us with suggestions on how we can improve things in our community. And I just thought, you know, that was wonderful because, you know, you hire a consultant to go out and do that and you're spending tens of thousands of dollars to have them come in and give you some ideas. <laughs> yeah. So I was just very, very excited to be a part of that. I just, you know, thank this council for allowing me to go there and be a small part of that. If it's at all possible, I'd like to see about maybe our next council meeting, if we could have uh, team members that were up there maybe come and give us an update. Mr. Thompson could come and Tracy and give us a little more in depth on what all you learned. And, uh, okay, you think we can maybe put something like that? Yeah, we can get it on the agenda. And I'll just add uh, one thing I thought was neat reading the report was um, they really talked about the brand and interviewing random people and random businesses and around the city and how the uh, people were really wrapped into the brand <coughs> enthusiastically and had pride based on that brand. From that, we've been getting phone calls and inquiries from other cities around um, America. Uh, how did you do it? How did you get this brand going? How did you get the whole community to um, have that kind of community support? And that was from the American Balloon Conference, where they, I guess there was a presentation there that talked about that. Uh, so it's been interesting to see uh, the results of America and Balloon. Uh, it is watched by a lot of people around the country. And after participating in that, I'm a firm believer that American Balloon really helps communities like ours and I just like to see this uh, city council continue to support that. That's all I have there. All right. Any, anybody else with old business? And new business? No new business. So we're going to move on to. Um, I've got someone in the audience who actually filled out a paper to talk. So Madison Leary, you'd like to come up and address the council? Good afternoon. Uh, hello. My name is Madison Larry, uh, resident at 2413 Mary Road. Also, I work for your fire department and a member of the Professional Firefighters of Tavares, Local 3245. Just like to, on behalf of the union, uh, express our thank you and gratitude for uh, your attention to employee rec uh, acquisition entertainment for the increase in COLA. Uh, Mr. Drury, I'd like to personally thank you for a comment that was made in our negotiation um, and you took it upon yourself to actually review the 10% increase around the uh, pay ranges. So we appreciate it. It's, it's known. Uh, other departments talk about it. So uh, just look forward to working with you, uh, the City Council and the City, and years to come. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else in the audience? Mr. Oh, Ms. Burley, come on up. Good 
Betty Burley, 214 North New Hampshire Ave. On the October 18th, October 25th, 1968, uh, at the City Council meeting Thursday, which was 10th, 18th, 1968, drainage problems were the main topic of discussion. A study will be made of New Hampshire Ave north of Main Street where flooding frequently occurs. Damage done to unpaved streets by growth equipment was another topic brought up by Police Chief Joe Gross. In trying to enforce the 1916 ordinance against damaging streets by equipment, it was discovered that applied only to paved streets. City Attorney Chris Ford was ordered by the council to draw up an amendment. <coughs> uh, paving of the parking area in front of City Hall on, tax, on Texas Avenue from Main Street to the intersection of Florida Telephone Corporation property has been started. Council members were urged to drop in at the city administrator's office several times between council meetings to keep themselves abreast of city problems and activities. Right next to this article there was hurricane passes. Hurricane Gladys passed over Tiberi's area lightly last Friday night and damage was slight. Yards that were filled with debris consisting of branches and mainly moss and some uprooted palm trees and shallow root plants were quickly cleared by Monday. These were piled near the curb, some as high as three to four feet. City crews will be busy in the coming weeks. Winds in Lake County at the peak of the storm range from 40 to 50 miles an hour with gusts up to 60 miles an hour, and some power lines were down. Um, I was pretty busy today. I forgot to get my agenda, so I was down here early this morning. Then I went to the city, uh, the senior luncheon at the church, and then uh, this afternoon I went to a combined meeting of the board, the library board, and the Friends of the Library, and on September 17th, the Friends of the Library was 65 years old. And um, also recently, I was honored to be interviewed by Style Magazine for Faces of Lake and Sumter. I knew that I was going to be on the inside, but I didn't know I was going to be on the cover. <laughs> <laughs>
and the fans, and they don't normally, every place else you go, there's a water pool. And at Woodley Field, there was two, and it's still where there's none. My second point is I would like to commend the council for a job well done time, and especially city staff, for providing the information so they were able to make the tough decisions. And Mr. Drury, your leadership in all of this is commendable. And again, on behalf of a resident, thank you very much for a job well done. Thank you, Mr. Senator. <laughs> Anyone else in the audience like to speak? Come on, somebody else got to say something good about us. Come on. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to reports. Uh, Mr. Jury? Nothing to add. Susie? No, thank you, Mayor. Chief? Nothing, Mayor. Bob? Nothing, Mayor. Thank you. Chris? Uh, just one thing, I'd, I'd also like to thank uh, Council for the support for staff of the American and Blue. Uh, the national explosion and recognition we got when we were up there made us all proud of where we're from. So, thank you for that. Brian? Nothing tonight. Thank you. Lori? Yeah, thank you. Chief? Mayor, yes, ma'am. I do have one thing. Uh, just before the meeting, I, I uh, got a call from Tommy Carpenter. Tommy's the Lake County Emergency Manager. And uh, so this is hot off the press. I didn't, I didn't even get a chance to brief uh, Mr. Drew with it, so I apologize for that. But Tommy wanted you all to know that uh, FEMA's coming to town. Uh, they are setting up a disaster recovery center here in Tiberias. So if you'll remember back, we had talked about this. It's kind of an on again, off again thing. Is FEMA coming or, or they ended up going to Orlando? But since then, they have, they have decided they need to come back to Lake County. So Tommy has been all day today trying to find a, a spot for them to uh, set up a disaster recovery center. And they were able to uh, finally accommodate them in the, uh, the uh, Lake County Ag Center over on Woodley Road. So this is happening very, very quickly. They are opening tomorrow afternoon for a soft opening from one day. And we'll push all this information out on the city website. Um, so tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock they will open, soft opening until 8 p.m. And then they're going to be open for four more days. And the disaster recovery centers have just been doing a, an incredible amount of business. Uh, so the throughput is, is sometimes three or four hundred people a day. So they were, they were challenged to need a place for the adequate parking and, and uh, you know, good accessibility and, and uh, ADA compliant restrooms and things like that. So the Ag Center uh, got the business. So they'll be there for the next four and a half days. Um, Small Business Administration is going to be there. They're going to be doing uh, short-term, low-interest loans for businesses and citizens, residents, and um, Chief Lubins, uh, Tommy wanted you to know that they will probably have their, their own armed security, so they won't need various PD to, to provide the security. Uh, but if that something comes up, they'll, they'll let you know. So that's uh, hot off the press, not even on the press yet. More will be coming out, but that's um, just um, came up just this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Tamara? Uh, yes, I have a couple of small things. Uh, art opening uh, reception this Friday evening. I'd love to have everyone come out and meet the artists. Um, our caterer was busy, so I am the caterer, so don't get excited about the food. It's probably going to be donuts and peanuts or something. But uh, I have good news. I'm like Richard. I had an announcement uh, made to me just moments before the council meeting. I don't think John knows about this. But uh, if any twin members are in the audience, I think I saw you, Lou. Um, big thanks to Lou and the Twig Group. They presented the city with a $500 check for candy for the Booth Fest, and we are so grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, it'll go a long way. We uh, we buy a lot of candy, but I'll tell you what, it's never enough, and everybody runs out. So very grateful. Thank you, and that's all I have. Lori, I don't have anything there. Thank you. Nothing. Nothing, Mike. Okay, first of all, I just want to say thanks again to Council for moving public safety forward on this. Um, I am so looking forward to getting this building in place, getting the guys out of the uh, old railroad depot, getting a museum in there where it belongs, and I'm looking forward to going down the pole. Um, <laughs> So I went to do that. My brother's back in suburban Chicago. I got on the pole and I went there and he says, so what are you doing? I said, I'm hoping I'm in this pole. 
It never went down that darn pole, but when we get this pole, then I'm going down that pole. I'm looking forward to getting that building done. You guys make sure I go down the pole. No backing up. I go down that pole, okay? Even my brother couldn't get me to go down. You guys get me to go down. I think I just have a couple of handouts here. Um, and don't be bashful. Here, I've got the, anybody wants. Um, we have, um, from Rifles and of History, the fifth anniversary, um, souvenir ribbon. Don't be bad for coming and take them. Some of the staff has them already. Take another one if you got it. We have extras. And just help yourself to one of the Rifles, Rails, and History. And again, staff did such a wonderful job in the community, in the businesses, because it was right after Hurricane Irma. And uh, so here we are on the heels of getting this award, um, this recognition from America in Bloom. It was even quicker than that, uh, after Hurricane Irma, that we were able to put together a large event like Rifles, Rails, and History. So please help yourself to one of our 50th anniversary souvenir ribbons. And the other handout I have is, I designed a new, and Betty Burley is on the board of directors of the Lake County Historic Society, um, new brochures from what I also believe is a Tiberi's destination, uh, the Tiberi's, uh, the Lake County Historical Museum in the historic courthouse, quality printing, a local um, printing company, um, printed us up some beautiful new brochures. Um, for the Lake County Historic Site and help yourself to them. We're very proud of the museum and where it's going as well um, there. So take help yourself to a ribbon, help yourself to one of the uh, brochures as well. And um, again, staff, thank you for everything. This has been a good council meeting. A lot got done. We're moving forward on a lot of things. Thank you, Mayor. That's it. Um, council Member Bogus. Council Member Smith. Yeah, I've got just a couple of things. Uh, Tamara, can you send Perry or somebody over to Woodleyfield and figure out what's going on over there? Yeah, somebody. Yeah, he works for Chris. So, yeah, I'll right. Okay, as long as it gets looked at. So, thank you, and uh, we'll see what's going on out there, and I'll probably take a ride myself to see what's up out there. Um, Chris, fantastic job, <clears throat> and John, uh, on the urban cleanup. I don't know if anybody's been uh, driven down through Gondor lately, <laughs> but they still have brush everywhere. So, good job on the cleanup. I know you guys worked around the clock. Uh, we had to purchase an extra call truck. It was needed. Um, so, fantastic on that. Brad, your, your guys have got to get accolades as well. Uh, you had, what, five generators? Yeah, yeah. And we had uh, one house with a backup out of two, two houses out of 7,000. Correct. At 90 <coughs> lift stations, that's incredible. That's an incredible amount. If y'all don't know, uh, lift stations are run by power. You run out of power, you can't get pumped. If you can't get pumped, there's only one way to go. I mean, water finds its own level somehow. So uh, for him to only have two backups in the city is absolutely phenomenal. So great job for you and your team. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, in case anybody was wondering, I don't have any history today, but... No, nah, I don't have any history. You want to do history? I'll go for it. I do it. Nah, I don't want to do it. So, so, but today is National Chocolate Cupcake Day, so everybody go out and get you a chocolate cupcake. That's all I have to do. I'm sure everybody's aware that this is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. A lot of people wearing pink out there. I uh, just want to also bring your attention to the third week in October is also male breast cancer awareness. It's not national, but it is recognized in Florida. It's been recognized in the state of Florida since 2011. And a lot of people don't realize uh, you know, that males can get breast cancer. There's about 2,000 diagnosed per year. And a quarter of those people end up passing away from the disease because you know they don't think to go and get anything checked out. So I just want you know people to kind of be aware of of that and uh, the other thing also in October is National Bully Prevention so I just want everybody to be aware of that as well and Tamara I'm looking forward to Boo Fest can't wait unfortunately I missed it last year but we plan things differently this year so we will definitely be in attendance and I can't wait to see it thank you thank, thank you so much I'm sure I will it's on there okay and I just want to reiterate how exciting of times it is right now 
to be a resident in the city of Tiberias or to even be a council member or part of staff. I mean, we've, we've got good things happening, and I hope you feel as good about them as I do. Without further objection, this meeting is adjourned.